Dear all, welcome to the Anamed Library Talks organized by the Anamed Library. Today we are hosting three distinguished scholars. Today's talk entitled Antioch, a History will be given by Andrea De Giorgi and Asa Eger. The talk will be moderated by Charles Gates. This talk will explore the writing process of the book and will focus on the archaeological and method methodological underpinnings that led to the, the historical presentation of Antioch, Antakya in Turkey. Before uh, passing to this exciting talk, I would like to introduce you our guests. Andrea De Giorgi is Associate Professor of Classical Studies at the Florida State University. He specializes in Roman urbanism and visual culture from the origins to late antiquity. De Giorgi has ex directed excavations and surveys in Turkey, Syria, Georgia, Jordan, and the UAE. Since 2013, he has co-directed the COSA excavations in Italy and currently studies the 1930s Antioch collection at the Princeton University Arts Museum. He has received numerous fellowship and grants, both from American and European institutions in 19 to, uh, 1919, 2019, I'm so sorry, uh, and 2020, he had a Humboldt Research Fellowship at the Freie Universität in Berlin. He has published numerous books and articles on archaeology, urbanism, and visual culture. Asa Eger is an associate professor of Islamic world in the Department of History at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. His research focuses on Islamic and Byzantine history and archaeology of the Eastern Mediterranean with a focus on the frontiers and the relationship between cities and hinterlands. Eger has directed excavations and surveys all around Antioch in Turkey since 2001 and in Israel, Cyprus and Greece. He currently studies the 1930s Antioch collection at the Princeton University and uh, 1970s survey material from the Tal Rufat survey, the hinterland of Aleppo at the Louvre Museum. He has published numerous books and articles on uh, the Islamic and Byzantine history and archaeology. Um, and in 2015, his book, The Islamic Byzantine Frontier, Interaction and Exchange Among Muslim and Christian Community, won Asor's Ernest Wright Book Award. As an additional note, he was also a senior fellow at Anamed in 2008 and 2009. Charles Gates, is a senior lecturer in the archaeology department of Bill Kent University, and today he will be moderating this talk. A classical archaeologist, he is the author of Ancient Cities, the Archaeology of Urban Life in the Ancient Near East and Egypt, Greece, and Rome. He took part in the field seasons at Kinet Höyük in Antakya from 1993 until 2012. And he is now among the researchers preparing the final reports of these excavations. Thank you all for being here. And dear attendees, um, last but not least, this talk uh, is being recorded. Your microphones are muted and cameras are off. Uh, you may type your questions on the chat. Your questions will be asked in the Q&A session. And thank you very much again. Uh, for being here. And now I will pass the word to Charles Gates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daphne. And thank you also, Irem, the two librarians for Anamed, for uh, organizing this session. It's a pleasure to be here with friends, uh, Andrea and Asa, in this uh, uh, intercontinental uh, presentation. They are in uh, North America. Uh, I am in Asia, and Daphne and Iram uh, must surely be in uh, in Europe, uh, unless they're on the Asian side of Istanbul. I don't know. Uh, so, uh, as uh, Daphne said, we're going to uh, concentrate on the uh, uh, on the writing of the book, how Andrea and Asa came to write the book and, uh, and then the whole process of doing so. 
but in the course of this, uh, we will uh, be learning about uh, what's in the book too. But I think that uh, to, to get started, um, it would be uh, for people who are not familiar with this book, Antioch, the history, um, uh, it would be good if uh, Andrea and Asa could make a brief, uh, give us a brief overview of what's, uh, what's in the book and what they were aiming to do. Let me just uh, share the screen. And thank you so much, Charlie. It's great to kind of see you, although not be with you all, and to Daphne and Iram as well. Um, and thank you all in attendance. Yeah, let me reiterate the uh, thank yous uh, to uh, to Animate and to uh, the public out there. Uh, I am going to basically get the conversation started by presenting the uh, the cover of a book that came out uh, this past uh, summer. But um, more to the point, in order to make everyone acquainted with the uh, uh, the content and the intellectual direction of this undertaking, I'd like to uh, to share the uh, the table of content so that uh, everyone gets to uh, appreciate the uh, the span and the actual breadth of of our endeavor. Uh, this is by no means a, a book that describes uh, Hellenistic and Roman or late Roman Antioch only. This is a long durée history of a, a city that was pivotal in the transformation of the ancient Mediterranean, um, starting with the Hellenistic period. Um, my, my friend and fellow Torinese, Nuno, Nino Luraghi, once said that the foundation of Antioch changed the ancient world in fundamental ways, and it was right on the mark. Uh, in that vein, our book uh, captures so the essence of the foundation, the growth and the transformation of Antioch through the ages. And, and thus uh, the, um, the content of the book very much sort of reflects all of these various, uh, these various uh, scholarly concern covering uh, the Hellenistic period, the, um, the Roman period, of course, when the city sort of rose to, uh, to remarkable promise and, and became the de facto capital of the Roman Empire. And then sort of we enter, uh, of course, the late antiquity and the extraordinary wealth of information, um, especially thanks to the voices of Libanius, Malas, uh, Procopius, and what have you. Uh, and, and then sort of we move on to the, uh, um, the transformation of, of Antioch in the Islamic uh, era, by no means bookending the end of Antioch sort of at that time. And I think as a sort of like, can, can um, elaborate on this. My, our first in stimulus here was very much to write a history that, that continues sort of after Justinian and after especially sort of the, uh, the seventh century AD, right, Aza? Yeah, we, I mean, as most everyone in this uh, panel and in the audience knows, uh, Hatay, Antakya is a, is a great thriving city. And we sought to really correct the kind of arbitrary omission by Downey that, <clears throat> and so many scholars that with the uh, Islamic conquests that sort of seals the city's fate and really tackle on how does a classical city become a medieval one? And so we have just as many chapters on its early Islamic history, its, um, Middle Byzantine uh, reoccupation as it's almost reconquest, a very brief Seljuk period, the Crusader period where it features very prominently. And that is a kind of interesting point. And then uh, another point in time after the Mamluk conquest, most people assume, okay, then the city finally, fine, finally was destroyed. But in fact, it wasn't. It was um, occupied and also in the Ottoman and Mandate periods. And so our thread that ties this huge history together is very much the question of urban transformation. Um, we also contribute uh, a new vision to the map of the city, which has always been Downey's um, 
one map that you've probably seen everywhere, frozen in time, but instead with the help of the extremely um, expert and talented Steve Batiuk, we, uh, we created 10 different maps of the city, figuring out how the walls change in every period. And this is really a kind of a wonderful contribution. You can uh, see. Yes, I think so. <clears throat> uh, I, I think this is uh, really super, these maps. We'll come back to that a bit later. Uh, let's start at the beginning. How did you get the idea to write the book? And um, also surveying uh, uh, publications already out there about the, the city in various periods. How did your uh, how does your book um, uh, um, strike a new path in the um, in the literature about uh, Antakya? But this is something that publishers always want to know. How is your book going to be different from the competition? I, I can begin, and then Andre can probably pick it up. So we were contacted um, by Routledge as part of their series, Cities of the Ancient World. And up until that point, they had published several uh, books on key, key and not so key cities. And we were asked, um, and I believe it was at your recommendation, Charlie, that in order for a book of, uh, I think they wanted to do a book on the history of Antioch and we, we were the ones to perhaps take it up. Um, there was no way I was doing this myself. This very daunting ask. And Andre and I have worked together in the region since 2002. And we thought this is perfectly timed. There is such a flurry of activity of research on Antioch now that there really does have to be a new history. And so we wanted to create that. And in doing this, this was definitely taking on a lot, but we realized immediately, we can't just write a short, skinny popular history of Antioch, it's not gonna work. What we really need, if we're gonna do it, we have to do it right and it has to be long and extensive. Yeah, I'd like to, to of course, to rehash some of these points, but. But also uh, one of the uh, uh, the factors that really uh, drove this this enterprise was the idea of yes, drawing on the legacy of Downey's seminal 1961 history of Antioch. I mean that book mm -hmm. is you know is you know basically a landmark. Um, you know you can beat that. You cannot rewrite that. I mean it's erudition 100. percent It's everything Antioch. However, that book has two, two, two problems in the sense that, again, as, as I previously said, uh, it really kind of bookends the story of Antioch with the, uh, with the seventh century with very little uh, attention to show what, what happens afterwards. And secondly, we really wanted, and this is, I think, one of the major sort of forces that sort of behind sort of this entire sort of undertaking, we wanted to convey a sense of a, uh, tangible, concrete ancient Antioch. Antioch is still considered this elusive entity, sort of, you know, not entirely tangible, not entirely sort of concrete in its monumentality, in its in this in in the ways that its built environment grew over time. And um, as and I deeply and firmly believe that actually Antioch is absolutely tangible and the uh, uh, the fieldwork that has been done over the years, so starting, of course, with with Princeton back in the 30s, all the way to sort of the uh, the spectacular uh, recent excavations um, in downtown Antakya, they very, very much sort of bring to to light in in all of its force, sort of the extraordinary layering and the extraordinary sort of concrete aspects of this city. And, and thus we try to weave these ideas, of course, of a rich textual repertoire that, of course, sort of guides our, our research, but with a, uh, uh, a very sort of concrete uh, element of physicality, a, a city that is real, that is tangible, that, that grew over time, 
and the traces of which can still be found on the ground, whether it's GIS, whether it's legacy data, whether it is the textual sources, epigraphy, we try to very much sort of come through the entire body of evidence available. And, and basically we added this, this bulk of information to, to the bulk. Mm -hmm. uh, good. Maybe you could, can you take off your um, screen share, Andrea, and we can just come back. Yes. To the, uh, uh, we can uh, put up pictures later if uh, need be. Um, okay, uh, Andrea, you've also already published a book about uh, uh, ancient Antioch, which I have right here. This is the book <laughs> at University Library copy. Uh, so a ancient Antioch from the Seleucid era to the Islamic conquest. So my next question would be, uh, what, what are you doing uh, in this current book that you did not do in uh, this book, Ancient Antioch? What is, what is the difference? Or should we read them both? What, what, what do you recommend? Yes, of course we should read them both. But the, <laughs> my, the, um, my point being that, that book number one, Ancient Antioch, published by Cambridge, uh, offer more of a, a peripheral perspective of, on Antioch. It, it had sort of like, you know, this interesting sort of like uh, take on things. I mean, I very much sort of explored the territory of Antioch. I explored the idea of, of a, a territory that had been in use long before the foundation of Antioch and why Antioch was founded and established where, 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 where it was. Um, and I very much sort of uh, explore the the, uh, uh, the formation of the Antiochene, this this is very vast territory that spanned between the, uh, the Mediterranean coast and uh, the uh, limestone limestone massif of Syria, sort of bringing together. Um, a universe of, of villages, uh, road system, the whole civic infrastructure, uh, less I ever should have uh, highlighting sort of the role of the city. With this new book, as and I very much sort of like reverted this, this perspective and actually sort of discussed this, uh, the city from the get-go, very much sort of like exploring and of course the body of textual sources but but again sort of very much sort of um bringing into sharper focus the territory and the place where the city was found and how the city sort of uh was first established and how it nucleated on the shores of the Orontes and how they incorporated the heights of mount Silpius and and it grew from there mm -hmm. uh okay so we should read both books that's quite clear uh, I have a question for Asa in the um, medieval and uh, Ottoman period. Is, is there uh, any book uh, that uh, before this one that has covered those periods in the same way that Downey uh, wrote about the, um, the ancient uh, city? Mm -hmm. um, any book uh, about another kind of city's bio or about no, Antioch? Uh, about, uh, about Antakya, about Antioch. Yeah. In the, in the um, uh, is there a comparable treatment of Antioch in the medieval and Ottoman period, uh, comparable to what Downey did for the ancient period? Yeah, no. The answer no. is actually very emphatically no. There are a lot of um, articles and there's new research and small studies, but a synthetic and comprehensive view of um, post-Islamic Antioch was actually really challenging to put together and required a deep dive into primary sources, um, a lot of secondary sources as well, but it came together, honestly, at the beginning, I thought, okay, some of these chapters are gonna be thin, especially Mamluk Antioch. I thought there's nothing on Mamluk Antioch. No one really has published anything secondarily either. And then it becomes one of the, of the beefier chapters of the medieval period, very surprisingly. Um, so yeah, the, the simple answer is no, this is very much that. But also what I I enjoyed about us doing this and giving its medieval treatment almost as much length as its pre-medieval treatment, it kind of, um, it sets a, 
a precedent that we should view these classical cities with a full biography. And the, the sources are out there and the information is out there and one has to get definitely creative for the Ottoman period, most of the sources are actually Western visitors to Antioch, as opposed to Antioch appearing much in Ottoman accounts. But yeah, all of that's out there. And it was a, it was a fun challenge to do, but not an easy one. Um, I wonder, uh, another challenge uh, which you mentioned uh, already is that uh, because the city has been continuously inhabited, uh, we don't have a really strong sense of the physical aspect of the city in any of the periods. So here you are, the two of you are archaeologists, and you are writing this uh, about this city, which is uh, lots of information from written texts, but uh, how did you... Uh, uh, how were you? Uh, how did you organize your thoughts about you know, how how to present this uh, get overcome this challenge? You know to uh, present the uh, physicality of the city, but relying on the the written uh, sources and, uh, heavily. Well, I I may uh, weigh in on this in in that uh, our our effort from from the um, from the get go was was very much to 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 supplement uh, this this great body of information with um, real archaeological data and and of course there's no shortage of that it's mm -hmm. just the nature of the uh, of the archaeology is so patchy and piecemeal when it comes down to Antioch that one has to to do an extraordinary job in terms of sort of uh, putting together reports whether. Um, uh, whether they're, um, they pertain to, to the Turkish excavations or the 1930s excavations. Uh, and one can only get glimpses of buildings and, um, and, um, and, and scatter pictures of, of what the, uh, the built environment of Antioch might have been. I think that the one effort it, that one has to make, and I think that proves very rewarding, was to divorce ourselves from from the textual sources in terms of like, hey, the form of violence has to be there. That was sort of the kind of operation that got the, the Princeton archeologists very much in trouble. They, we, they just followed the sort of whatever Malas or Libanians were, were saying about the whereabouts of buildings and, uh, and the monuments. And rather we sort of like, you know, we looked at the evidence that's available. What can we glean from, say, from the excavation of, say, a sector like 17O um, excavated in 1937 and certainly in, by no means a, a non-spectacular yet very complicated dig? Can we extract a story from that? Um, so that's, in essence, how we went about the uh, perusal and the appropriation of the archaeological archaeological data sets. Again, there's plenty of that. It's very, very jarring material in the sense that we have to sort of like operate the sort of like the synthesis of, of materials. And it's not an easy one by any stretch of the mind. Nevertheless, it proved um, a um, a win-win in many ways, because I think that we were able to glean even sort of small stories from, again, very problematic digs, like for instance, 17 which figures very prominently in, in a book. I will add also um, the toggling back and forth between the, the physical environment that we know of from excavations and the text very much also was a, was a challenge for us to see can where do these come together? Where do they fall apart? Where does one check the other? But for sure, um, we're very much aware and open that a second edition, hopefully there will be a second edition, um, can incorporate a lot more from the archeology, span which is sort of what you were asking, Charlie. And a lot exists with the uh, Hatay Museum in salvage excavations throughout the city that have not really been published because they're just more internal reports and those can be brought in. 
And we're also part of this republication of Princeton's own excavations. And we're constantly making new connections and uncovering new information from there. So I expect that the second edition will have even a kind of more robust uh, character in terms of the archaeology of this continuously inhabited city that when you go there and visit, you're first struck by the fact that there's actually not much to see apart from city walls and a hippodrome and, and a ruined temple and then a piece of aqueduct. And so, yeah, very much this is kind of a, another kind of challenge to bring to light the ancient medieval city um, from beneath this growing modern town. But looming over all this are these uh, Princeton excavations of the 1930s. And, um, you know, until we started the, till uh, Maria began the Kinet uh, excavations in uh, 1992, uh, there had been no archaeological excavation in Hatay province for uh, since I guess uh, Woolley stopped at uh, Alalak in the late 40s. So you know, a huge gap. So this, these Princeton excavations in the 1930s were there. And uh, uh, I think very intimidating for the, uh, for the ordinary archeologists who might uh, want to know. You know the, the mosaics were out there. We, we saw all these wonderful mosaics from, uh, from uh, uh, Daphne. Harvey, but otherwise the finds from the city itself was kind of uh, 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 overwhelming and uh, uh, super complicated, and recorded as uh, uh, as being having been a failure, a, a, you know, a big disappointment. So I wonder um, if you could say something about your you have uh, uh, tackled these, uh, gone into the archives, you've worked at uh, Princeton and. How did you get going with that? And what have you found? Uh, how have you proceeded through that? And then, you know, how has that then uh, you know, eventually colored uh, the kind of information that you've been able to put into the book? Yeah, I can begin to answer that. We first started looking at this material, I think my first visit was 2003 and Princeton's museum had has 300 boxes of material that have never been studied. And looking at the sort of the contemporary city and the difficulty in obtaining any um, option to excavate there at the time, this was a very interesting and viable avenue to look at the, the legacy excavations. And so with the help of Princeton and a team, um, definitely spearheaded by various groups at Princeton, the museum, the visual resources department, the Department of Art and Archaeology, the Firestone Library. We put together a small team and we selected one sector of the city to see, can we do this? Can we get all the objects from there, the dig reports, the plans, the photos, and can we, like a, you know, ridiculous puzzle, <laughs> put this back together and is there a purpose before we tackle the rest of the city, which might be a big waste of time. And so that was the sector 17.0 that Andrea mentioned the form of the reputed form of balance. So we're just now publishing that and it proved to be an amazing success. And we are emboldened to move to other sectors now and do the same kind of treatment and it's, as you said, Charlie, it's kind of this amazing wealth of material and so much can be done. And in addition, there have been several undergraduate classes at Princeton. I'm teaching one now, which are also pedagogically using this as an exercise to see, okay, this is a legacy data dig. We have everything, can we put it back together? This is a great project for undergraduates to kind of do high impact and, and real-time research as well. So that's really kind of fueled our um, personal investment in the city. 
I may I may just just add that um, that our current book and uh, and the, the future books books that uh, Aza just just referenced are at the end of the day they they're building this methodological and conceptual plateau on Antioch that that hopefully will be useful to the uh, um, to, to the Turkish excavations and the and the, uh, and the projects that are going to be published uh, by the Hatay Museum and uh, Mustafa Kemal University. So, uh, in the sense that at the end of the day, we are going to very much sort of make this conversation um, uh, more and more exciting. And uh, down the line, if we were proven wrong or something, well, that's okay too. I mean, uh, you know, that's basically sort of the bread and butter of what we do. But as, these are, however, sort of uh, the collections in, uh, at Princeton and our engagement um, with them at the end of the day mm -hmm. is a, uh, a an exercise that is very much in in dialogue with other projects, uh, whether it's the uh, uh, lexicon topographicum that's being um, run by Catherine Salieu in Paris right now, or uh, the uh, the various excavations that are unfolding in Hatay at this very time. And they're all part of a, a general discussion about Antioch, and we're just contributing sort of a, uh, a long story that is um, compelling and that is still sort of that still needs to be told, and that is the story of the Princeton excavations. I'll add a small amount. In treating the, the legacy data of the Princeton excavations, which was from 32 to 39, we also realized that that too is part of a history of the city. We talk about it in the book that we're talking about today in the final chapter as part of the uh, French mandate, Antioch and Antioch and the Hatay kind of at the real time breaking away from French mandate and, and becoming part of the Republic of Turkey. All that is swirling around. As you said, Charlie, as well, they, um, they, they thought of it as a failure so this also gives us an opportunity to look at archaeology 90 years ago and what that was like and all of the kind of hopes and dreams, the shortcomings and failures as well with, uh, with a detached critical eye as well, looking at their methodologies, what worked, what didn't, um, even some of the intrigue, the plots of intrigue grant funding, partage, sharing of fines, all of that is included as part of this um, very long history of Antioch. I wonder if um, uh, uh, just uh, uh, the mosaics are um, found in all sorts of museums uh, around the world, I guess. Is that true with the other finds from the dig or are they only in Princeton and Antakya. There's a, uh, a scattering of, of materials that mm -hmm. is outstanding. The balkanization of the, the Antioch 1930s collection is extraordinary. Of course, sort of the mosaics are sort of being this ephemera that captures sort of the beauty and the glory of Antioch, sort of, and being having been the most coveted of all the, the finds, sort of ended up at uh, gazillion locations. Uh, our colleague um, 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 Jennifer Stagger from from Hopkins has done a, a great job in terms of like you know mapping all the whereabouts of these pavements. And you'd be surprised looking at this map. You know anywhere from Honolulu to Dallas to uh, Saint Petersburg, Saint Petersburg, Florida, and, and so on. We're talking about three hundred. Yes, <laughs> and Cuba. Um, I mean, there's no shortage of, of places where these mosaics ended up being. Um, of course, the mosaics are sort of major uh, part of the of the Antioch story, a uh, story that, that, of course, um, is um, uh, central, uh, is fundamental in our understanding of of, of Antioch, but also sort of like you know, also limited. I mean, there's so much more. And even in terms of the um, the finds, um, the the finds also sort of basically pop up at every North American museum. Uh, anytime that 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 we go to, sort of like you know visit visit collections at some museum, whether it's even sort of the teeny tiny Bryn Mawr College, just sort of a La Rigo collections. Lo and behold, there are there are finds from from Antioch. Um, the dispersal of the collections um, at the in the aftermath of the um, 
of World War II sort of was was it was absolutely uh, skyrocketing, and and basically we tried to sort of like you know piece together uh, this uh, entire collection in keeping with the fact that as as as, as I said, uh, Princeton still holds uh, three hundred and something boxes of materials that are waiting uh, scholarly treatment. Yeah, uh, I'll add a little bit to that. Um, and this is also answering, I see Mem Mehmet Kemal's uh, question. Yes, uh, well, now there's 330 because um, we've reboxed some of them. But for Charlie, specifically for the non-mosaics, they had a, a slightly different trajectory. Mosaics were very much taken back and almost given as uh, recompense for to any donor, you know, you get you give many of the project and you get your very own pavement. For the ceramic finds, most are we believe at Princeton, but there is a huge amount in the Hatay Museum, and this is an kind of an X factor. We when the museum several years ago moved to its current massive big location from its uh, smaller venue in the middle of the city. We asked several people, to, can you, do these exist anywhere? Are they in some basement? Nobody was able to find them. For sure they're there. And we have object cards of whole vessels and it says stamped Hatay or Antake Musesi. So uh, the Hatay Museum does have a bunch. Um, we just have to find them and see if we can access them. But Little caches of pottery, as Andrea was saying, do show up. For example, we just had a colleague at the University of Oklahoma Museum, and we thought there was some there, and the museum didn't know, that, didn't think there was any there. And then just as she was leaving, she sort of looks at some nondescript box on a shelf that has no label and said, well, what's that? And they open it. There's 40 or 50 pieces of Antioch pottery just sitting there. And I think the motivations for how these small caches of pottery got there were as study collections, because Antioch can give you the full ceramic range from Hellenistic to 14th century uh, CE. Then all of these um, ceramic archaeologists around the US would get kind of a nice little study collection to use for teaching and so on. So I think that's how that's how they ended up around. Uh -huh. Okay, well, I can see this is another research project for someone to map the location of all the non-mosaic finds from Antioch, but that would be really helpful. Yeah. And then, uh, yes, penetrating the Hatay Museum, uh, that's, um, uh, of course, uh, uh, an adventure uh, in itself. And uh, Antioch is not the only site uh, uh, that uh, would benefit from that kind of exploration inside that museum. Anyway, we'll cross our fingers that that will happen uh, um, someday. Um, I'm interested in how you, um, <clears throat> um, um, uh, well, I'm interested in the visuals. Okay, I'm going to <clears throat> uh, turn to that right now. So you have this book, you have a, <clears throat> it's a long manuscript, and you're dealing with a city which, uh, you know, it's not like Ephesus with lots of standing or remains from the, from uh, any of the earlier periods, you know, apart from the, the walls, I guess. So um, how did you decide on um, uh, how you would illustrate the book? And how did you, how did you go about doing that? I think I can begin and, and Andre can step in. Uh, I think we very much felt that we needed to just dispense of the Downey map once and for all. And our colleagues Gunnar Brons and Ulrich Wefferling um, had just completed this magisterial uh, survey of the city walls and all the features associated and prepared this new map. And we were able kind of graciously to adapt um, the, the real map of the city walls and all the towers. And um, very much with Steve Batchuk's help, create 10 plans of the city. So that was kind of our framework for the figures. 
We also wanted to include a sense of the Princeton data. So lots of figures um, with the, the kind of wonderful help of Julia Gearhart at Princeton, lots of photos, not only of the excavations themselves, which might for the non-archeologist be a little bit boring because just looking at kind of crumbly things, but, but also the excavation team and just to kind of get a sense of that sort of black and white world, really the cover of the book as well, um, that you can't see Antioch, I don't, the sun is in my face, so we can look at that cover later. Um, and then also with all of these travelers coming to the city, especially in the 19th and 20th century, there's a huge array in this tradition of etchings and old photographs and car uh, woodcuts and, and all of this of, you know, very much Orientalist, um, that kind of, you know, sleepy Oriental Islamic city with some soldier in a robe kind of smoking an argila and, you know, mm -hmm. in the corner and, and the crumbliness of the ancient city around, which was also really wonderful to illustrate and illustrate the way uh, Western travelers engage with what they see as a sort of a um, decrepit city. So those are three huge categories of figures that I think we really felt necessary to include. Um, we did have others. Well, of course, when it comes down to, to Antioch, uh, we also had to, um, to um, fully leverage other, other media. Uh, and um, we got a lot of support from a number of institutions, uh, especially when it came down to say, using uh, their numismatic collections. And uh, of course, the, uh, the coinage of, of Antioch is extraordinary. And but we were pretty lucky to sort of uh, to um, to receive the permission to uh, to publish a, a number of coins, whether Seleucid, Le Roman, and so on. Um, of course, uh, Princeton uh, and the uh, the Department of Art and Archaeology through visual resources, and I'm referring to to Julia Gearhart, they were extraordinarily um, uh, generous in letting us use the whole repertoire of images. I mean, we're talking about an extraordinary body. Of, of of illustrations that we could simply draw upon and 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 use to the um, uh, in the best way possible. Of course, we also had to sort of you know seek permission to use some other some other media, and I'm thinking especially of the uh, iconic uh, Tuke or Taiki of of Antioch. How can you publish a book on Antioch and not have the Taiki? So we had to sort of of course um, interface with the uh, with the Vatican Museum and their collections. And uh, as you all know, sort of the uh, uh, the copyrights don't come at a, uh, at a low price, but they were gracious enough to sort of like, you know, to basically give us a good deal. So uh, there you go. We were able to, to publish once again, the uh, uh, the famous uh, Antioch, uh, Tuque of Antioch by Eutychides now in the um, uh, corridor of the Candelabri at the Vatican Museum. So in so doing, we again we we assembled a uh, a vast body and very diverse body of images uh, with, of course, the maps very much so sort of, uh, taking uh, the the upper hand and uh, having that visibility. If if anything, because you know they're, they're the first real maps of, of Antioch and and they again illustrate how the uh, the city evolved over time. Yes, I think the maps are just a, a tremendous contribution uh, to put uh, to at least you know just even a, as a hypothesis of what the city looked like in, uh, in right. different periods. I'm, I'm glad you, you're using the term. I mean, like I said previously, uh, with the flurry of excavations and studies that are happening right now in Hatay and elsewhere, I'm sure that down the line there will be new information available. We are starting a conversation. Of course, we had our set of conundrums when it came down, for instance, uh, to the description of the Hellenistic fortifications. The, the, uh, the perimeter of defenses uh, of, of Antioch is a, uh, a palimpsest of the entire history of Antioch. We're talking about 10, if not more, different phases of construction, each sort of representing a, a moment in the history of Antioch, each representing sort of a, uh, 
a moment of crisis, a moment of say repairs and all kinds of sort of vicissitudes. Uh, tackling the city walls was a, uh, uh, a pretty daunting task. Of course, we uh, went with uh, Christiane Brasse's seminal study of the walls, sort of like adding um, sort of our own take, sort of trying to wed sort of the, um, uh, the material element with what we know through the textual sources and sort of like how we can best interpret the, the textual sources. So in so doing, we propose a sort of a, a reading of the city walls, but once again, as I said, um, um, with the um, ongoing extraordinary output of studies, we hope that that we start a conversation and that sort of people will, will ameliorate what we've produced in terms of sort of like, you know, many of these buildings. And we did, um, for those who haven't seen the book, we thought it important enough to include the, the kind of expose of how we mapped Antioch with Steve Batyuk as an appendix, because that was is kind of a fascinating um, experiment in its own way. And I think many people would be interested in, it's a combination of, I'm not gonna go into it now, but also looking at the present street grid uh, where roads are, where roads aren't, trying to look at satellite imagery to see um, what the topography is, what the geology is, where the river course may have been, um, old kind of demarcations from 60s corona imagery that are faint and still visible. So it was a whole process, but a worthwhile one because um, the walls are arguably Antioch's best feature, talked about in every period by every visitor, all the way to Evliya Chelebi. Um, and we do have a translation of his uh, description of Antioch. And it's very much the city walls that everyone remarks on all the time, and still today are still standing, mostly still standing today. Yeah, well, I think this is a great contribution. It was, it's going to be a wonderful point of departure for all other researchers in the future to um, you know, engage with your maps of the different periods and uh, with the new findings that will be coming up. Uh, and the illustrations as a whole, uh, leafing through the book, uh, a great variety you have um, you have uh, photographs from the excavations, old and uh, old ones, new ones. You have uh, maps of various sorts. You have uh, uh, what else? You have people. Um, uh, it's uh, a great uh, the coins. You have a great variety of uh, illustrations. So I think that's a, a real um, uh, nice quality of the book. I'd like to ask about your collaboration, uh, writing. Of course, you, you knew each other, you've known each other for a long time, but uh, setting out to write a book together, it's quite different from writing a book by yourself. Uh, even though you are, uh, you have, uh, you're a um, specialist in different periods, so you're, you know, one was doing the first half, the other the second half. But I wonder how you coordinated it, uh, the, the project. Do you have different writing styles and things like that? How did you, were you going to read each other's work? What, what, how did you, um, how did you uh, organize this? Who should begin <laughs> now that we're talking about <laughs> <laughs> um, I can, I'll begin. Um, okay. So we've known each other for a very long time and we've worked in the field in this region for a very long time. Um, I think the, that underpinning of being close colleagues, partners in crime in the field and close friends, um, first of all, really helped and was key. We did decide to just straight up divide the book and write the chapters that we're comfortable writing about. So Andrea would write Hellenistic Roman, late Roman, um, and up until the Islamic conquest. And I would write the Islamic and Byzantine, Middle Byzantine Crusader, Mamak Ottoman sections. For the introduction, we wrote that together. And actually in the final chapter, we wrote it together. So once we would each write 
then we would send it to the other to read um, and make comments. Um, one thing that we decided to do exactly because of this reason, Charlie, as a way to sort of get a, a third voice was we um, hired an editorial, a developmental editor. Her name is Jen Ryder. She was hugely helpful to be able to read everything together and connect it in, and smooth out maybe the, the rough parts of, of not, I mean, even with our, within our own chapters. And we did face this question. I remember thinking about it when I started reading Andrea's chapters, I was thinking, how is this gonna work? Andrea has such a different writing style. Andrea writes almost like a poet, very poetic style and beautiful language. And I write more like a kind of matter of fact archeologist, like a dig report, which, oh, I mean, I was inspired by, powerful. what was that? A Starfula attendant. You're, you're, yes, you're right absolutely there. good. You write very uh, beautifully. I mean, I, I was very inspired by his writing. And then I, I guess I just realized why try to smooth out the, those different, we, we clearly just wrote different chapters. Not only did we read each other's, but we read the whole manuscript together several times as well. Um, so there was a lot of kind of back and forth. I don't know how Andreas take his. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're too generous. Uh, anyhow, I, th I concur with with all of the uh, all of the uh, uh, the points that that Asa just made. But I have to say that also, I mean, the um, of course, writing a book is a, always a major endeavor, and you know, you go through these phases of creativity, and you know, phases when you think that that whatever sort of like your pen in is is terrible. Um, it's you know that roller coaster of emotions, and uh, and we all know how that feels. But there's something to be said about the fact that as I and I, sort of much as we come from, from different angles, uh, we were interested in the same questions. We were interested in sort of discussing the evolution of, of a city that is, again, pivotal in, in more ways than one. Uh, and we really wanted to sort of like, you know, discuss the community how, and how this community sort of was part of this continuous relentless transformation. We wanted to sort of focus on the people of ancient Antioch, how they were part of this, this built environment. And so that made it really easy because uh, I thought that we'd be, we'd be exchanging chapters and sort of, and bouncing things around. And at the end of the day, the questions were always the same. I mean, we were, we, there was clearly like a, uh, a unitary vision that underpinned the project, even though we didn't have, we didn't have to come up with a manifesto or like, you know, try, let's try to adhere to sort of like, you know, this idea. It was actually pretty, pretty natural. So things went seamless in, in that regard because of, again, so sort of like in this vision and ultimately, I think of course he, he and I have this insane passion for Antioch, Antakya, Hatay and the people there. So that made it easy. Um, of course, we had to reconcile gazillion sources, gazillion uh, data sets. Um, but at the end of the day, sort of with this sense of sort of direction that was pretty firm, things went relatively easy. Well, I was thinking, um, uh, you know, I read an early draft of the book and uh, you know, you're dealing with 2000 years of history. So there's just a, 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 a overwhelming number of uh, names, you know, different peoples, different writers, um, for Greek, Muslim, different traditions. So the person who's uh, coming to, you know, as, as you were, the two of you writing, you were familiar with this. So you, this is quite typical. The, the, it's like the PhD dissertation writer who is so into his or her subject that it's, it's you know, when they then get a job at a university, they have to teach uh, uh, first year undergraduate survey courses. It's just uh, so difficult to come down to earth uh, again. 
Um, so you, you're, you would be familiar with all these names and things like that. But I wonder if you're the editor, editorial um, helper that you, um, uh, that you hired, uh, was she uh, um, helpful in uh, um, uh, providing reader-friendly um, comment uh, suggestions for the book, like subheadings or the the indexes, uh, uh, you know, to, so that people not familiar with the, a particular name could uh, easily find out who that person or group was. Uh, absolutely, she she was. Um... I, as a small example, I remember for my chapter on the Mamluks, of course, I just assume that everybody knows who they are, right? Because everybody knows who the Mamluks are. I don't know. And she she actually wrote uh, a paragraph in the beginning of it explaining who they even were. Um, and so things like that, you know, help us come down to earth. And she is... Uh, I mean, fortunately, she's a, a medievalist, but a Western medievalist. So she gave a kind of a very great perspective of, of someone who really doesn't know anything about the Eastern Mediterranean, but knows about the medieval world. Um, and so she definitely created subheadings and, and that kind of thing and accessibility, especially I think in Andrea's chapter on, and this might be one of the more complicated aspects of Antioch, all the Christian um, sects of yeah. Antioch, which could be really complicated. Yeah, Jenny was absolutely instrumental in keeping us honest. Uh, and yes, the chapter on, on, yes, religious dilemmas and Christological debates. I mean, she was definitely sort of like um, uh, the one person who basically would uh, uh, will try to show to bring some order to a uh, very very confusing universe and and you know exactly what i'm talking about but but even in in say you know for instance sort of you know I, my 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 early chapter on on hellenistic antioch of course was laden with greek terminology Take it for granted that people know what the Alcumene is. And, you know, most people out there, most of our readers, they do know sort of, you know, what the Alcumene is or sort of technical terms referring to ancient Hellenistic cities. Sure. But um, I think that that the great uh, element that, that she brought was this idea of sort of making, you know, making it clear, sort of explain a sort of what, um, what a polis is. Because not everyone out there sort of may maybe in the know. So uh, I think that she she contributed in, uh, in, um, in fundamental ways. How did you find her? Was she recommended by Rutledge or? Actually, she was recommended by a colleague of mine in my own department, um, Emily Levine, who does um, kind of modern Europe studies, who used her for her book. But it turns out that she was a classmate uh, of another colleague in my department, Rick Barton, who is a medievalist at Santa Barbara, I believe. And they both were doing their doctoral work at the same time. So there was just some nice serendipity and connection. I will add also for the index, um, although we do try to minimize terminology and names, but we, did, we felt we had to strike some balance because from in many cases, especially the medieval chapters, this is the first time they are being mentioned. And so it's useful to kind of put it out there. And so in that way, the index is three parts, uh, places and people, and then varia, I think, as we called it. Um, and really, I hope the reader finds it useful. Uh, we'll definitely take that feedback for the second edition. But right, it's a huge cast of characters. And I know that we did make some ad hoc choices, for example, in the Mamluk chapter. Um, I thought it is important actually to include some of the original Arabic terminology because they've not been in print before in uh, translated or in English maybe for some of the more Libanius and Malalas references, they have been referenced a million times over in English. So we made some 
kind of uh, inconsistent choices, but those were the motivations. Yeah, that's going to be really helpful, uh, helpful too. So anyway, it's glad to see this. Maybe in your next edition, you might have a glossary or something. You'll get feedback to how people are uh, responding to this issue of these, uh, uh, huge, as you say, huge cast of characters. Um, I guess uh, we've talked about an hour here. I, um, uh, let's see, I guess, um my only other question uh that i would like to ask would be about uh ax yes uh, the questions has come up from uh uh here on chat uh getting this to turkish readers and the turkish translation yeah i um, guess that we're here on anamed uh maybe anamed could provide and coach university as a press yeah, incidentally, uh, incidentally, uh, we will leave the uh, the Q and A for for later. But our friend Murat, hi Murat, Meraba, uh, is asking whether there will be a uh, a Turkish translation. Um, uh, as has been as as spearheaded this initiative, right? You may say a few things about it. So we're uh, we're talking also to our colleague Ayşe Hari. Um, and we're hoping, and we heard it also from from people in Antakya, no less. Uh, there's an entire contingent of folks who are like, well, I mean, we need a Turkish version. And yes, they're right. There has to be a Turkish version. Um, uh, and we're happy to facilitate sort of this kind of um, uh, this kind of project in any possible way. And Aza, would you like to to chime in on on, on this? Yeah. At this point, um, I believe this is the most up-to-date information. Coach University has agreed to do this um, and they will contact, I think the way it works, they contact Routledge, they set up a contract between them and then, uh, but we don't have the translator found uh, in place yet. So we are taking steps and that definitely is the next stage. There has to be a Turkish translation, um, full stop. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that would be wonderful. Of course, that costs money. The translator needs to be paid. And this oh, yeah. is a long book, 500 pages. So, uh, but if Coach uh, University is really uh, willing to. Uh, Maybe someone support, in the audience here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> if and there's anybody, there. anyone willing to take this one up, believe me, we'll be happy to, to work with them. Um, but I think for the people in that. In, here in Turkey, especially people in uh, Hatay, this will be uh, it would be just super to have this. Uh, well, and, and, you know, and and we want to make sure that that people in Hatay sort of you know get our perspective on things. So um, yeah, yes, yes, yes. And for you know the people in the museum who are working on the uh, their excavation, salvage excavations. Uh, uh, in the city and uh, environs, um, and all of this information, which may be um, in, in English and other foreign languages, inaccessible, uh, it's uh, a great ideal uh, to to uh, uh, try to make this uh, uh, accessible to uh, to people uh, there. So that will be a good uh, uh, project that we we'll, uh, hope will be realized uh, sooner. Let's see, before we go to the questions, is there anything else that you would like to say that I have not brought up right away? I think I've been glancing at the questions in the chat and they, yeah, they seem to kind of, to bring us more into, into the content of the book, which will be a great pivot in general. Um, I, mean, I would just say to everyone here, I mean, we are, very much, this is not a final say of Antioch in any way. In fact, this is just the door opening and there's some amazing folks in the audience, amazing scholars who do work in Hatay and in, in parts related to it. And so we're very open to, for a second edition, to bringing in new information, new perspectives and that kind of thing. Uh -huh. Uh, good. Well, let me turn to the questions here. Just a second. 
Okay, oops. Uh, oh dear. Well, a lot. I've lost my chat. Um, okay, I, I've, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. Okay. I think Batuhan uh, was the mirror. Back. What? Was, or, Batuhan was the mirror was the, uh, the first question that was asked. Yeah, so it. she's asking, uh, uh, have you studied the ancient visual representation of Antioch, the architectural border of the Yakto mosaic, whilst writing the book? Are there any new ideas regarding the mosaic? Well, I mean, the uh, the Yakto mosaic is basically the the epitome of, of all the Antioch mosaics in many ways because of the obvious implications. So, so thank you so much for, for the question, Batuhan. Um, I think that the last study that uh, appeared on the scene as far as the actor mosaic goes uh, is one by uh, Gunnar Brands, uh, and he was especially interested in the issue in the appearance of the uh, of the Castalia Spring on the on the um, on the on the frame of the of the mosaic. We we use that, of course. How how who are we to uh, to disregard this fundamental piece of information? Um, we use that again, sort of uh, as a, as a depiction of an ideal itinerary, of an ideal representation of places uh, in the environs of Antakya, whether it was Antioch or Daphne. Um, who's to know? Uh, the possibilities are endless. We're looking at this remarkable sort of juxtaposition of places and the people moving, people going around their business, children and people playing um, uh, games and what have you. Um, I don't think that, that we've moved on from, from the, uh, the general interpretation of the, uh, uh, of the mosaic and uh, its, uh, its, its visual implications, but certainly um, we we leverage a sort of this 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 idea of you know this this gripping representation of the city and some of its more, most uh, iconic monuments as a presentation to sort of like you know to a uh, to a fifth century viewer. Uh, good. Here's a, here's another question. Uh, I'm not seeing full names. Maybe this is Elif Dano. Uh, there are so many areas of research. If you had the opportunity to conduct field work in Antakya, what would be your ideal research question or questions? And where physically would you like to see, uh, would you like to uh, have as the focus of your field work? Um. What a gift if we had such a thing. And thank you, Elie, for the for the question. I, I mean, we could go on all day with this sort of wish list. So for me, and I'm sure for Andre, it might differ. I think the irony is when you go to most major classical cities, what you do see is the monumentality that has been done, that was always prioritized, the theaters and the churches and whatever. Um, and so, you know, new scholarship and new um, directions and approaches now really want to see more the, the smaller and the quieter aspects of urban transformation, not just public monumental buildings, but residences and domestic places and, and workshops and industry. For Antakya, we actually don't even have the public monuments. We don't have really any churches. There was only one excavated and wasn't even in the city. We don't have any of the temples. We don't even have the palace. So it'd be great to, on that level, um, do some excavations around where the reputed island was in the royal palace um, and finally figure that out. Um, that would be wonderful. For me personally, one thing that I always wanted to work on was the question of the citadel. Um, because the citadel, which is on the mountain and overlooking it, only appears in the second half of the 10th century. And it has really interesting implications for how such a thing is incorporated into a city. Is it just for a garrison? Is it for refuge of the population in times of trouble? We have textual references that say it's that and the other. Is it a prison? 
Um, how is it incorporated? How is a castle incorporated into an otherwise sort of very open city? That to me is always interesting. And it's available to dig. There's, there's nothing on top of it. Um, but also so much, we might, uh, Andrea, I think you have your, your wish list as well. Um, there are actually a lot of spaces within the city to dig and just expose, like 17.0, just a city block over um, 2,000 years. What does that even look like? Yeah, I can only concur. I mean, after all, uh, domestic architecture in the city uh, is uh, one of the, the major the major lacunae. I do indeed have my wish list, and I'm, but I'm thrilled to see that the excavations on the island are sort of unfolding at this very time with more work that's been done in the Hippodrome area. So I'm really, really stoked about that. But if I were to sort of like, you know, to, um, to do my own thing, well, there's definitely no lack of, 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 of great, great targets um, that I have in mind. And the slopes of Mount Silvius and the slopes of Mount Star and um, the, uh, the stretch of land between Harbia and, uh, and Antakya, uh, of course, it, there's a great deal of development uh, at this very time, but nevertheless, I think that there's great, great potential. Again, to sort of like, you know, to focus on those questions that, as I just mentioned, not really the grand and the beautiful, rather, houses, uh, infrastructure, um, and uh, you know, all the kind of evidence that's going to, to very much sort of corroborate what we know about, about Antioch. Um, I, you know, this, at this point in time, I, I'm not particularly optimistic about sort of the, um, the discovery of the, of the Church of Constantine or the, uh, the Palace of Diocletian. Um, of course, there's there's work being done on the island, and I hope that that's going to uh, to uh, to bring some dividends. Uh, but I think that it, it it is probably like more rewarding at this point in time to sort of like you know to learn more about again sort of like these aspects that are still unknown. Again, houses, uh, tenements, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, sort of the infrastructural systems that connected Daphne to Antioch. All these questions, and I think that they're still. Um, a good margin to sort of like, you know, to, to do field work. And, uh, and I, feel, I think it's perfectly viable. Thank you, Eddie. I, yeah, and I would add in, in the spirit, um, I mean, so many of us have worked together in the region and in the spirit of, of Antioch and it's kind of um, very much as this sort of mixed cosmopolitan diversity, which is I think question coming up. It would be great to see some collaboration with the museum, with the Mustafa Kemal University, and with all the researchers coming in from the outside on some of these projects. It would be really wonderful to, to bring kind of all this excitement together and have some really lovely collaboration. But in this light, I was, um, <clears throat> when I made a trip to Rome a few years ago, the, the one when I, uh, Maria Ariette and I visited uh, Cosa, where Andrea was running an excavation. I was very impressed in Rome by this museum called the Crypta Balbi, ah. which is a kind of slice of life museum. It's just an area in the center of the old city that documents the changes uh, in that block, large block, from ancient times right through the Middle Ages to modern. Uh, my eyes were just uh, and lots of detailed information. This is not uh, an easy museum necessarily to take in, but I was uh, uh, so impressed by that. And I thought, well, I couldn't think of anything like that here in Turkey, uh, how great that would be. And maybe Antioch, Antakya is a place where it would be a candidate to have a, a museum like that. Uh, yeah. That, that, that's a great point. The Crypto Bobby is very much a sort of this, um, uh, this again, palimpsest of, of the whole history of Rome with a lot of emphasis on, mm -hmm. on Middle Ages. And, and especially sort of like, you know, to the, uh, to the viewers who are not sort of prepared for, for sort of like, you know, this documentation of medieval Rome, the museum can be a little complicated, a little too much to take. But it's it offers a sort of this incredible sort of span of life and this this long narrative of settlement, and you cannot find it elsewhere. And um, 
Antakya is a place that lends itself so well to an operation of that sort. And um, and who knows? Maybe this is this is something that uh, to me, I mean, it's absolutely applicable. Um, who knows? Maybe down the line there'll be there'll be folks who sort of like you know will think that an operation of that sort um, could could happen in downtown Antakya. Yes, Let, let's go on to the questions. Uh, okay, here's a comment from Hussein, maybe from Toronto. I was born and raised in Iskenderun until I was 20 years old. I wanted to make a documentary about Hatay and have been searching historians to help with the content for the last 24 months. I've reached out to at least 40,000 people in related groups on the internet. That's a lot of people. Uh, with no success in finding any interested people. I'd like to send out another call for my project here, if I may. I'm open to any suggestions. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, I guess you could um, uh, get contacts through Animed, through, uh, through Daphne uh, Gear, who's uh, running this and uh, circulate your, your um, request and people then can uh, uh, send in answers uh, for you. And you can contact Asa and uh, Andrea too. I yeah, I'm, I'm happy to help um, uh, whether we participate or not directly or other people. I mean, in, in attendance here, there are a bunch of people that yes. um, work in the, in the hot type largest province and around the city so uh you found the right place to, to yeah. make that request happy to help in any capacity mm -hmm. and here's a question from anna i don't have the surname uh who asks about um i would like to know more about the inhabitants of the city who were the inhabitants of this city i believe we cannot talk about concrete ethnicities but can we come up with some identity markers? How have these identities evolved over time? Well, this is a biggie. This is a biggie, um, but thank you, Anna Maria. I think that um, uh, you hit a, a, a central point. Uh, from, the, uh, from its establishment, Antioch could boast of a, uh, 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 of a constituency of, various origins, Greeks, Jews, Persians, uh, folks from Mesopotamia, um, Macedonians. Um, the sources are, of course, uh, rich of, of, of information when it comes down to sort of the profiling of this um, uh, conglomerate of ethnicities that all combined created this thing called Antioch. It started off as a Seleucid colony. The interesting thing is that this legacy of the multi-ethnic city continues through, through the ages. And in the Roman times, for instance, um, we know that uh, a number of the, um, of the city blocks sort of carried the names of the, uh, the most prominent citizens. And there's this inscription that, that celebrates the completion of a uh, of a, uh, of a uh, canal for the usage of the fullers. And we have a few names of the so-called plinteia, that is the city blocks. And each of these plinteia sort of carries the name of, again, of a prominent citizen. Many of these names um, uh, have Semitic or Persian or Persian origin. So thus informing the, uh, the provenience of these folks and and I think that that very much sort of bespeaks for the uh, for the, the, the very sort of diverse character of this conglomerate of, of folks who lived in in Antioch, and it continues through the ages, and and even sort of like right outside the sort of Antioch, uh, the um, this the Semitic component of the population sort of adds a, a completely different different element to sort of like into a, a generally speaking Greco Roman city. Of course, Greek is sort of being the lingua franca. We sort of like you know tend to to assume that that Antioch was a an ancient Greek city, but the truth of the matter is that 
Uh, this is a, a city that's multi-layer that sort of like is uh, consists of a uh, patchwork of cultures, traditions, religions, and languages. Of course, you have the Romans are sort of like, you know, trundling in and bringing sort of like, and seeking to, to bring their own take on things and seeking to give their own spin. But there's, of course, there's very little Roman stuff. I mean, strictly Roman. I mean, of course, the sort of the, um, the, one, the one major issue is that uh, the epigraphic habit at Antioch is virtually non-existent. And by that, I'm basically stressing the fact that um, we're used to, to the cities of the, um, of the Mediterranean East, and we know how garrulous they were in antiquity, sort of hundreds and hundreds of inscriptions. Think about Ephesus, think about the great cities of Asia where you have epigraphic documentation for centuries. Well, uh, Antioch has very little uh, epigraphy that we can play with, and and thus a sort of the names and sort of the kind of sort of uh, intertwining of families and marriages and what have you that are typically sort of like you know what we do with cities elsewhere sort of does not happen for Antioch. So that's an element that has greatly frustrated. Uh, research, but but nevertheless, there are like you know these continuous glimpses of folks of sort of like a various origin. You have John Chrysostom, sort of like who speaks loudly of his uh, brothers in Christ to sort of like you know come to Antioch, but they don't speak any Greek. They don't understand any Greek because it's Syriac, and that is Antioch to us. That is the Antioch that we write about, that we try to model and to reduce to sort of like you know to a. Uh, uh, a microcosm that can be wielded and so I understood. Thank you so much for this question. Um, I'll, I'll extend a little bit more about what Andrea said, which is, <clears throat> which is a core question. And we highlight this in the book from the beginning. Um, of course, this is kind of a claim, a hallmark of Hatay and Antakya today. I was just there in the summer and there is a store sign in front of a shop which shows the, the massive head found by the Tayanat excavation team, um, which has now become a, a sort of a symbol of Antioch with uh, you know, a crescent moon and a star of David and a uh, cross. And that's even on the, the, tax, the side of taxis, right? This is this kind of a city of diversity. Um, when we could, we very much engage in identity, religious identity or ethnic identity in the city. Um, throughout every period. And that goes right up the way until the mandate period when we know in the Ottoman period that there are very clearly carved out neighborhoods for Christians, but for Nuseri, uh, uh, Alevi, uh, Alevis, and also kind of Turkish Sunni Muslims, those are all very clearly delineated. I think that is another question that's gonna come up later, I saw in the chat. and. But I think what we were struck by more times than not, when sources refer to the Antiochenes many times, they actually often group them all together. And this is often in the face of either conquest from the outside or some governor or ruler that's been assigned to look over Antioch and who's not from there. And we've, we see this over and over again in every period, <clears throat> that it's the citizens of Antioch. And it doesn't say which citizens or which groups or whatever, which actually come together and depose a ruler or man the walls or that kind of thing. So um, I think that's a kind of fascinating, uh, raises questions of urban cohesion that maybe uh, transcends across ethnic religious identity. But we do have some, and I'll give you one last piece, then we can move maybe to another question. Now we are publishing 17.0, this sector we mentioned several times as this um, city block full cross-section of the city. Cryptobalbi. What was that? <laughs> no, it's like the, the Cryptobalbi project, basically. It is, it is. And maybe that could be our template, actually. Um, the last phase, we have three courtyard houses and they all have ceramic kilns and they're producing very fine pottery. And this is, so we, this is amazing. We also have though, um, hidden under the floors of two of these houses 
are Byzantine-led seals with the names of specific prominent Byzantine officials, but this is also during the Crusader period. So what, what is going on here? Is this actual concrete evidence of um, Byzantines living in fairly nice homes, running some fairly nice pottery industry, but during a time when the city's under Latin Crusader occupation. So some, uh, there are kind of windows that open up here and there where we can begin to see, okay, there is something we can say about identity, different identities living side by side, who's running what, um, who's in charge of what. So stay tuned for that publication. <laughs> Yeah, that's a big, wonderful, wonderful question. Uh, here's a question about uh, prehistoric remains uh, of the region. Uh, me, I don't have the full name here. Uh, I'm a PhD student working on the genetics of the prehistoric humans of the region. My question is, where did you start looking for information from the 1930s? Did you first talk to museums, collection managers, archaeologists, most of them must be dead by now, or did <laughs> literature research or something else? It must be really hard to hunt down samples, artifacts from those early digs, and I might end up having to do the same. Uh, I guess the question is, you know, how, do, how does one get started with uh, dealing with all of this, the old information, the legacy information? Well, I mean, we're, we're fortunate that uh, the Princeton University has um, spearheaded this initiative to, uh, to make uh, all the Antioch records available to the public. And, and not only that, we're, we've basically contributed to the transitioning of these uh, archives to say a more sort of uh, systematic platform called um, um, Ocker. And that's run by the um, Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. So that now all these data sets can be not only perused, but fully harnessed for, for, for research. And I invite you to sort of to, um, to take advantage of these uh, of these great um, uh, these great tools. Um, this is just sort of like how it all started. Because I mean, I, I share your disquiet in terms of sort of like where do I begin? I mean, like you know, do you talk to each individual curator? Well. We were fortunate because, again, Princeton has this uh, very well organized body of materials. Um, we also had uh, good conversations with the Worcester Museum and many other institutions here in North America, all the various institutions that uh, accommodate portions of the of the Antioch collections. So, uh, and with time, as as I previously said, we've we've proceeded to uh, to entertain conversations with curators nationwide and and to the extent that that materials ATF materials will constantly pop up I mean I think it all started uh, many years ago when Aza and I we were still in grad school and and visited um, the dendrochronology lab at Cornell which was a wonderful wonderful experience but we were also shocked that you sort of like you know to the, and Cornell was extremely generous to us and they gave us time and space and I cannot stop thanking for that um, but we were also sort of like in in a little bit state of yes disquiet because we would open these drawers that were like you know laden with Antioch shirts that with no provenience or sort of like, you know, they had just sat there for, for a long time. And we weren't really sure of or sort of like, you know, what the course of the right course of action was. So um, I hear that now sort of like, you know, all those materials are sort of like, you know, are now sort of in, uh, uh, have been have been treated carefully and 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 all that, but but indeed, sort of like uh, there are great tools out there. So that's that's the way to also sort of like end, end up sort of stumbling in uh, in pre classical materials. I mean, we have like you know by say combing through the uh, the materials, we ended up finding a uh, an cuneiform tablet of the Neo Babylonian period that, that had not previously sort of like attracted any interest from anyone and we were like wait a second what is that and uh and this is like in the uh, in the lower levels at in the uh, 17 excavation so that is a big deal to us and, and of course we very much a foreground sort of like you know these kinds of stories because these are stories that really open 
uh, new exciting vistas onto sort of like, you know, the whole narrative of settlement and the focus of, for instance, on 17L. Um, I would just add to um, the person who asked the question, Nihan Daltash. Um, also, this is a re reciprocal engagement. And while we as researchers can come and swoop in and benefit from the generosity of, of uh, museums and archives, I think we can also give back. And very much that was the foundation of the basis of our relationships that we formed. Those 300 boxes at Princeton, nobody's had the time, the, the funding, the interest to go through them all. So thank you, you know, so much for letting us go through them. And then we're gonna give back and help tell you what they are and then so you can catalog them. And I think that that reciprocity in, in dealing with collections and so on is, is really a wonderful relationship that has to be built from the beginning. Yeah, and don't be afraid to uh, ask questions of people. Most people are willing to answer you. And uh, there are always exceptions, but uh, keep trying, don't hesitate, and you'll, you'll find uh, what you're looking for. Uh, here's a question. Uh, is this Rod Schneider, perhaps? Uh, yes? Yeah, hi, Rod. OK. Uh, I've been uh, curious about silk. I was told in Harvey that it was all local, but how did the worms get there in the first place? Uh, do you talk about silk in your book? You a little bit. Um, silk really appears more in the medieval periods, um, unsurprisingly. I mean, definitely Ottoman Antioch and Mamluk Antioch, there's a lot of silk production and um, selling in the markets and it's known then. Um, we see it a, a little bit before, um, I have to actually go through and see when the first mention is. I don't know that I, I can say the actual answer to when and how the worms did get there in the first place. Mm. As an aside, although this is a very superficial statement, Antioch is a terminal point on the Silk Road. Um, that is coming from East Asia as a land route and ends in Antioch. And at that point, things can, uh, can go either out to sea or over to Constantinople, Istanbul. Um, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that the worms came that way, but there was that kind of connection. We also see, um, well, we do have connections with East Asia very early on. We even have a Chinese delegation that comes to visit um, and look at Antioch in, I'm blanking now, in the, I think it's maybe the 10th century, um, and remarks on what they see, which is a wonderful description in Chinese, by the way. We do have Chinese ceramics, luxury ceramics um, that appear in the Princeton excavations. So um, of course, silk worms may have been already in place well before any of this. Um, that's all I really can, can answer for that question, Roz. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, here's a question about um, new Syries and uh, uh, Alawites. Uh, do you think research and articles, uh, do we know everything? Uh, how, how much have they been studied and uh, is there, uh, there room for more? Always room for more, always room for more. Oh, I think, um, I mean, there's some great people doing work on them. Uh, Najati Alkan, I think, is here. I think he is, is part of the, this group right now, um, who's done amazing work. There's always a lot of work that can be done and, and welcome more and more people doing that work. Um, even from an archeological perspective, the, for example, the MOPSA survey, which is, a huge survey that was done, directed by Anne Killebrew, in relation to uh, our kinet work on the other side of the mountains of, of Antioch on the coast, revealed many local shrines tucked away uh, on the slopes um, that only you needed local knowledge to know where they are. And they are tied in with, I think, Nuseri, um, things, some dating back to the Ottoman period. Um, I think that's 
wonderful to explore where you actually have the physical uh, remains, some local knowledge maybe tied in with villages around. And, and I think there are many avenues to explore with, with that. And Antioch is a, a great focal point for that research. Uh, now here's a comment. Is this? It says Ross, but I, I, I but uh, uh, the, the person is writing. I went. Congratulations! I went to elementary school in 1951 to 53 in Antakya, and visited 10 years ago, and could not even find my school and the house. I am so impressed about your research, and would like to go back to see the city again. Thank you for this wonderful, informative talk. Uh, Thank you for that um, nice comment. Uh, here's the question uh, for Asa. Can we describe Antioch as another, well, Tugurj, a Wasim town in the early Islamic period? Have I pronounced these correctly? Yeah, um, thank you, Korai, and hello to you as well. Um, so for those of you who don't know what the, the Thugur or Awasim is, these are the names de designated for the, in the mostly early Islamic period for the frontier province. Um, it can be, the Thuhur can be any frontier, but it's mostly used for this one, um, right up against the Taurus mountains for, <clears throat> and against the Byzantine empire. Antioch is definitely described as an early Islamic Thuhur town. Um, Awasim, for those of you who don't know, is, is a later, almost administrative term for the kind of rear guard of the frontier created by Harun al-Rashid, of which Antioch is mentioned as one of its capitals. So this is a whole nother um, identity for Antioch at some point where you have these annual raids into Byzantine lands and Antioch is at the heart of it. It becomes a frontier town um, from which raids might go but also most importantly for trade. Um, and Cora, and Cora, I know your own work has really focused on, on that kind of trade. And so I think when we're looking at what can Antioch be in the early Islamic period as a frontier town, not just necessarily a place where people are living and then going off to war every summer, but also it's producing a lot of um, objects for the surrounding frontier towns. And we see that very clearly with pottery, for example. Pottery being produced in Antioch and around, we see in all other frontier towns. So it's, a, it's also a kind of supplier for the frontier economically as well. I think that's, personally, I think that's its, one of its biggest roles actually in the early Islamic period. <clears throat> But it's, we don't also have any mention really of it um, being raided by the Byzantines up until, uh, not until the 10th century. And we don't really have any concrete mentions of, of strong garrisons, like for example, the city of Tarsus, but it very much I think is this thriving um, economic center um, and sort of almost like hub nerve center for the frontier. Uh, good. Here's a question about um, <clears throat> from. Uh, I don't have the full names. I'm sorry. Uh, how, what is this? Huda Helula. What? Huda Helula Bailaz. Okay. Thank you. How do you distinguish the classical period from the medieval one, especially a Roman late antique from Byzantine period? Which event marked the end of the former and the beginning of the latter? What would you say is the most drastic change in the urban layout of Antioch during the shift from the classical period to the medieval period? Um, <clears throat> yeah, Andrea, I think can best tackle the sort of Roman, late Roman Byzantine distinction, and then I can tackle the, the drastic change from classical to medieval. No, oh, I mean, I think that the where I mean, this dialectic of change and continuity is very much a sort of like one of the main threads uh, in our in our book. Um, for the sake of the narrative, we had to, of course, sort of divide the book in chapters and each ch chapter pretty much corresponds to some kind of like periodization in history, the Hellenistic period, 
the Roman period, late antiquity, uh, starting with the severance, you know, and there are all kinds of schools of thought, and we understand that. This was a uh, sort of unnecessary evil uh, because, I mean, this kind of periodization very much sort of counters the vision that Aza and I have for the history of Antioch, a history that, again, uh, is uh, characterized by this extraordinary sense of continuity. So, Ray, uh, if we were to seek a, a chasm between Roman Antioch and late antique chasm, and late antique Antioch, uh, really there isn't one. I mean, the city sort of continues to evolve, still uh, holding on to its Hellenistic plan. After all, the city walls are sort of like, much as they were pulled back and forth and adjusted and sort of sometimes enlarged and sometimes uh, they will also shrink, they however sort of uh, proceeded to contain a, a city that remained true to itself for for centuries. Of course, you may argue that sort of, you know, certain buildings identify the transformation of Antioch and the appearance of the, uh, the great churches and especially like the octagon of Constantine. Or say, think about the grand plan that Valens had for the city, the restoration of, of Antioch's centrality, big forum temples, a celebration of memory, celebration of the heyday of the Roman Antioch and all of those great, uh, great, great um, um, incentives. But the truth of the matter is that, again, so there is this, this sense of continuity that, that is certainly not um, uh, altered by sort of the modification, the cultural modifications of the city. So the appearance of, of Christianity, for instance, is sort of like, you know, and the, uh, and the fierce upholding of Christianity that occurs in Antioch, it doesn't really change much in terms of sort of the structure and the fabric of the city. Of course, buildings are added, new routines and new itineraries. But the truth of the matter is that there's still this shell that holds this thing that we call Antioch together. And that really doesn't vary. And we, the historians or the archaeologists, we have to find measures to, to basically sort of to model this complexity and sort of like and navigate sort of these, the, uh, the obvious um, uh, minutiae of the historical and, and archaeological, archaeological uh, uh, records. But, uh, but again, we, we argue for a city that stays true to itself and continues through the ages. Um, to address the drastic change of urban layout, we don't actually see a drastic change of urban layout until the Mamluk period. So the early Islamic city, and I think the Byzantine city, is very much keeping in the, at least layout-wise, continuity of the Byzantine city. Um, where I think there are changes is really in uh, less visible things, its relationship to the countryside, for example. Antioch becomes more self-sufficient and more divorced from the countryside. And so parts of the city, um, as the city begins to contract gradually, are given over to agricultural lands within the city walls. So ruralized, the city becomes maybe more privatized, more self-running. Uh, self the, the drastic change, and I see we have so many questions, is after the Mamluk conquest where all of a sudden they almost create a brand new Islamic city that is completely different than what came before. An enclave which is very small and in the frame of Antioch is to the southwest quarter near the river and near the, the main bridge today. And it very much is an Islamic enclave. In Mamluk sources, it's actually called an Islamic enclave. This is um, they kind of dispense with the grandiosity of, of how big Antioch was. And all that stuff is just be, basically a ruin field. And that is also the template for the Ottoman city. So between the Crusader and Mamluk periods, that's the, the drastic change that we see. Thank you. Uh, here's a question about underwater archaeology. I think this might concern more the coastal area rather than uh, Antakya itself. So I could just say a pers uh, just a, a word about what happened at Kinatuyuk. Uh, there was some underwater 
exploration on the, along the coast, uh, there were difficulties. Uh, the water was often quite murky. Things couldn't be seen. Uh, there's also the problem that uh, Hatai province is uh, right on the edge of the country. So military security uh, issues to getting uh, permits to uh, poke around underwater uh, were, uh, were difficult. But yes, uh, that should, uh, that certainly could uh, um, be a source of uh, uh, interesting research uh, in the future. Uh, here's a question about, um, I guess it's about uh, uh, people from Antioch uh, themselves uh, writing uh, about maybe autobiographies about their personal experiences in the city. Uh, written by local uh, Armenians, Greeks, Christian, uh, Muslim, Muslim Arabs, Jews, and, uh, and Turks. And the question is, uh, while writing this biography of the city, to what extent could you utilize diverse narratives or uh, autobiographies written by people living uh, in the city? Uh, I, I wonder how you uh, uh, tackle with uh, the, the lax and secondary literature and then the, of course, the wide spectrum of languages uh, being used. We <laughs> We, we tackled all of it. Um, and the, uh, thank you. This is uh, Mohammed Maza, I think, who asked this. <clears throat> we definitely tackle all of it. And we have sources not only of travelers and visitors, but uh, Antiochians. Of course, the, the most notable are Libanius, um, who, who lives there. Um, but also, there are many people that temporarily live there. Um, Julian kind of is there very briefly. Uh, we can look at later sources. Uh, Masudi um, lives there briefly. Actually, a lot of people live there very briefly. Um, and so we incorporate them as well. I'm, of course, we want to give uh, privilege and value to um, accounts by Antiochians themselves, but they also come with their own bias. I mean, Libanius is... Uh, 11th oration in praise of Antioch, the Antiochikos, is a wonderful source, but at the same time, he is a fan of his hometown. <laughs> and so we have to kind of filter um, the way we look at, I mean, a huge fan, <laughs> the way we look at accounts coming from within the city um, to accounts describing the city externally. Yeah, if I may add my uh, my thoughts on that, uh, we of course sort of draw upon the uh, the great sons of of Antioch, uh, namely Libanius, Ammianus, Marcellinus, presumably, uh, and of course John Malas. And and uh, yeah, I'd like to rehash some of these thoughts. I mean, Libanius indeed is the the authority on Antioch, but. Uh, you have to treat him with 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 prudence. Um, his, his his survey of Antioch is one that never ever includes churches, and churches existed at the time of Libanius, and they were like you know pretty popular. But his version of of Antioch is one that is completely bereft of anything that has to do with the Christian God. I mean, he's he's very much an upholder of the of the good old pagan days of of, of Antioch. Antioch. And the same applies with John Malas, another prominent son of son of, of Antioch. I mean, and I don't need here to sort of um, um, to reiterate the, sort of the caveats when one reads that text. But it's an interesting text, nevertheless, in that it very much sort of like describes a history of the of the universe from from the shores of from the banks of the Orontes. It's a history that's described from from Antioch. Antioch is at the center. Of the universe, and it's not because he's sort of like you know he very much is sort of like he's the proud son of Antioch. It's just that Antioch was indeed one of like you know the most important cities of the ancient world, and um, and thus his his narrative it remains no matter how complicated and jarring it could be, but still remains very much central uh, in the in any in any discourse of, of Antioch, whether it's historical or archaeological. So so yes, we gave absolutely like you know centrality to these voices. 
Uh, we're coming to the end of the questions. Here's uh, one more. Um, in the southern part of the Kurtulush Street, my classmates and I studied a house which had roots of a, of a vault in the underground level. The house in almost in front of the Sarmie Mosque. As far as we studied, there's no concrete proof that this area was a part of the city before the Ottomans. Is it possible that uh, actually the city was bigger than it is depicted in current historical maps? I haven't checked your book maps yet. Um, I So I did look, uh, I looked ahead here. First of all, that's amazing. I, we'd love to hear more. This is, this is exactly the kind of uh, thing that we need to know more about, um, these little glimpses. <clears throat> And yes, that was part of the ancient city. So the that mosque, this, the Sarmier Mosque, um, is in the southern part. It's on the main street, would have been the Cardo. It's right next to the Orthodox Church. And it's actually right near what would have been the southern gate to the, the classical city, um, but inside the gate. So very much part of the classical city, becomes part of that Mamluk Ottoman enclave, of course, too. Uh, I can't say whether the vault, what period that vault dates to uh, at all, but it very, that section of the city very much was, would have been you walk in through the Southern Gate, which is called the Daphne Gate, um, of various names, and you don't go far up the Cardo and, and you, you would have encountered that site. Uh, and here's a question about the, um... What it, what's your opinion about the roots of the present food culture of Antioch, a treasury heritage of culture? The best. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm just craving some Antakya food uh, in this very moment. I mean. Uh, <laughs> well, we're, we're not food historians. I think I can speak for Andrea too. We are definitely food appreciators uh, when we go to the city, I think as everyone is. Um, but it might be ripe for a kind of a lovely uh, a food history study, especially, you know, the key ingredients that we always see is, you know, the kind of spice, the walnuts, the pomegranates uh, that are kind of classics and, you know, Antakya cooking. Um, I haven't encountered really any sources that talk about it being a sort of culinary capital in the classical or medieval worlds. Um, yeah, but I can think of mosaics that very much sort of bring to the fore this issue of the presentation of food. So it seems as though there's there's been a a, a pretty uh, durable tradition of you know basically taking pride in in uh, food making and in presenting sort of uh, a variety of delicacies and uh, and and that appears clearly in the archaeological record. So. So the fact that right now contemporary Antakya has this remarkable sort of tradition of cuisine and uh, um, and, and unique dishes, I mean, it is 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 no surprise. Um, it, it's part of sort of a, a long a long story. Yeah, so we'll have to find a food historian to amplify yeah. that uh, question. Uh, here's one on um, uh, sources for the Ottoman period. Were you able to draw from Ottoman archival sources or is your an analysis more based on the archeological material? Thanks a lot, greetings from Berlin. Thank you. And this is of course coming from Feliz um, who has been with us at Kinet. And- Feliz Tutunju. <clears throat> yeah, mm -hmm. hi Feliz. Oh, hello, hi Feliz, if you're still here. Hi Feliz. Um, excellent question. I think there is far more uh, digging that can be done in the <clears throat> in the Ottoman archives. Um, I came up a little bit <laughs> short. I'm also non-Ottomanist and I do not read Ottoman, but for the second edition, I think much more can be done. Um, maybe. Uh, what I found was most interesting were the 19th and early 20th century travelers to the city, which um, both describe the state of the ancient city but really describe the state of the Ottoman city, its markets and so on, its administration. And I found that to be very helpful. That also has to be used with caution. And I take the time out in the book to talk about it. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of Orientalist um, 
just weird descriptions of Antioch that are <clears throat> don't sit well in a, for kind of modern perceptions. Um, so one has to sift through that. As far as archaeology in the Princeton excavations, oddly, zero. I think there there is, I mean there there is virtually nothing ceramic wise from the Ottoman period here and there. And I think that is because most of the excavations were not within this Ottoman enclave. I think they were in the parts of the city that were left abandoned, were agricultural fields or orchards, and Daphne was not occupied in the Ottoman period either. So I think that's the reason why we really don't have the archaeology material to back that up. That's interesting. Uh, the last question here is concerning uh, uh, I, I, from Beryl, I was curious about the presence of the Christian community in today's Antakya. Is it possible to pinpoint a single period or siege in history to trace their origin, such as the siege of Antioch during the First Crusade? Or is it a result of the encounter of several events and arrivals developed over time? Ah, well, thank you, Beryl, for your for your question. Well, no, I mean, in the uh, um, the early church of Antioch so harkens back to the uh, to the uh, to the days of the apostles and their proselytizing, and so they're um, they're 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 traveling around uh, the region and uh, and bringing to the fore the great news of Christ's resurrection. Uh, as a matter of fact. Antioch is the first place where Christians refer, refer to themselves as such. So we have a, a long tradition of Christianity active in Antioch it's as early as the mid first century uh, uh, AD. Uh, and, and thus a sort of, um, it, it comes to no surprise that, uh, that Antioch figures so prominently as one of the, uh, the beacons of Christianity from its early days. Now that, of course, is sort of like you know translated into a, uh, um, um, a, a the appearance of, of traditions and interpretations of the um, of the of the doctrine in ways that that were not necessarily uh, in agreement. That sort of lacked this sense of adhering to sort of like you know to a core sort of sense of direction. And no wonder why sort of Antico was such a um, a, a thriving center for uh, for for all kinds of sort of Christological debates and uh, and Christians are sort of like you know, very much disagreeing upon sort of like you know, the nature of Christ Himself. It all starts in the first century AD and it continues you know in this in the following centuries and eventually it ushers in a, a Christianity that is incredibly divided. In the fourth, in the fourth century AD, Amianus Marcellinus referred to Christians as animals because they, they kill each other. They cannot agree on a single thing. It's a, a Christianity that is strong and solid, very much rooted in, in Antioch, but it's extremely divided. And, uh, and uh, some of those divisions very much sort of like resonate in the contemporary landscape of Eastern Christianities. I will also, I'll just add quickly. Um, so this is this is a kind of trope for Antioch. It's the site of the first Christian community, the, the first place where people call themselves Christians as a group, the first Christian church. Um, we have no reason to question that, but we also know that the source sources for that are not, well, the, um, the Bible <laughs> being uh, kind of, and sources also the Quran, uh, Sites it doesn't mention Antioch specifically, but likely is referring to that is the place where monotheism is emerging and beginning. So whether we take those sources at face value or not is a question we have no reason to to question, but we can. But it's the fourth century that we really know, and um, Antioch has a Christian community, and I believe they are participating in the conferences that are being held by um, by the emperors. Council of Nicaea and so on. And so we definitely have it since the fourth century. The Crusaders did not bring Christianity. Um, they brought the Latin church to Antioch and that was not an easy welcome either. And there are tensions between the Latin church and the Eastern Christian churches. 
Okay, thank you. With that, our time has now come to an end. And I think we have almost answered all, almost all the questions. Uh, there was one more, but I'm, I'm afraid we'll have to uh, skip it. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrea and Asa. This has been a pleasure for me. And, uh, and I think your book is, uh, looks just uh, wonderful uh, and uh, a great achievement. So congratulations to the two of you. And um, thanks to everyone who has uh, been listening and uh, for all this time. And I'm now going to turn it over to Daphne to, uh, to close the uh, session uh, uh, for us all. Uh, thank you very much all for this wonderful talk. Uh, it really gave a great picture of the emergence of this book and also the, its multi-layer aspects. Uh, I strongly believe that everyone who will read this will, but this book will have a completely different uh, perspective on Antioch. And if they have the chance to visit Antioch after reading your book, I think that will be um, Better. A, a beautiful <laughs> uh, advantage, privilege. Um, so I would also like to thank you, our listeners. Uh, we received lots of questions. It was, uh, it's always great to have such a engaged and interested audience. So thank you very much for all your questions. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity to briefly mention our next talk uh, that will happen in February. Uh, so next talk, our next talk will be on the 1st of February and it, the talk will be given by Erdem Kabadaye from Koch University. Uh, and the title of the talk is Urban Occupations, OETR, a, a geospatial humanities project aiming to map and examine long-term changes in economic and population geography in Southeast Europe and Turkey. So that is our next talk. Uh, on that note, thank you all again for this wonderful talk and, um, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Bye. Bye.